Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Orbit. And today we are joined by Mayor Joyce. Mayor, tell us a little bit about yourself. What do you do? Yeah, so I run uh, a redesign studio, and we can talk about what that means, uh, called Do Big Good. And I live in Seattle, and now I'm out in my front yard, which is where I've been working from during uh, the warmer months of this pandemic. Yes, absolutely. How did you get into the field that you work in today? I know it's a bit yeah. of a journey. <laughs> It's definitely been a journey. Um, actually, one of the things I did during the pandemic was adapting Do Big Good from doing impact measurement, which is evaluation, to doing redesign. Um, and that was really influenced by the most recent Black Lives Matter uprising. Uh, it just, I was, I was, I was pretty involved in the first Black Lives Matter in 2014. I mean, I actually, I went down to St. Louis and, and, participate in the mobilization in Ferguson. Um, and still, when the uprising occurred again, sorry about the background noise. Yeah, all good. Yeah, <laughs> we're outside. Um, I was shocked at how, what a massive national movement it became. Um, and I guess what surprised me the most in a very positive way was just that there were so many people all across the country really showing up to transform policing, which is policing is kind of like the knife's edge of white supremacy in the United States, right? Mm -hmm. It's that like actual mechanism of violence by which white supremacy is maintained, right? And, and there's been so much rhetoric around, um, you know, the value of policing and like, I love law and order as a kid, you know, it's like, oh, I hate injustice yeah. and the police are creating justice. So I totally bought into that. Um, and uh, so it was amazing that a lot of people were just seeing through the bullshit and were like, no, ACAB, yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, and so, especially since obviously our country has moved so far to the right um, under this president. So I said, oh, wow, there's this, opportunity to be really transformative as a firm uh -huh. and to really rethink you know all of our institutions which are obviously the um the products of white supremacy and capitalism right yeah you know like healthcare is how do you make money off of people being ill <laughs> and it's like that's how we got our healthcare system and it sucks yeah. right <laughs> yeah it, like, it works for the people yeah. that designed it yeah which is Com companies, right? Yeah. Companies, yeah, yeah. And maybe some pharmaceutical firms. Um, or, you know, ed education, which is, you know, like, you know, well-meaning well white people creating, like, I guess public education I'm thinking of, like, well-meaning white people creating a system for black and brown children that are not yeah. their children. And it's like, gosh, why would that not work? Hmm. <laughs> I'm glad that we, like, we see the need for redesign. And yes. it seems like a lot of your um career has been in digital activism mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. to you like to you what is digital activism yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so that was that was my first career uh -huh. and i think that um i am an older millennial i am 38 so when i was growing up i was taught by my parents that you pick a career and it's really important and you know thank god for the feminism that happened before me but it was always a given that I would have a career, that my work was important, that, you know, so that was not a fight I had to fight. But um, there was this idea of, you just pick a career and that's what you do. You know, like my mom is a college professor. My dad worked on Wall Street, which is like an interesting bit mm -hmm. of my own, like how my critiques came out of that. Um, but they just like picked their careers and they did it. And so I was like, oh, I, you know, I cared about since I was a very young about injustice and activism and, um, always been interested in you know, innovation and what's next. And so I picked digital activism as this career. It didn't really exist when I started doing it. I had to explain what digital activism is, which is basically, you know, um, social movement work using digital tools, mm -hmm. social media, particularly at that time. Um, and I was like, great, I love this. It's so interesting. I love the people that work. I, the people that work in that field are still awesome. They're just like lovely, lovely people. And I was like, great, my career, done, awesome. Um, and I had a lot of fun in my 20s doing that. And then at the end of my 20s, I just kind of 
I think the technology was being co-opted by the right and by the forces that be, and there was disinformation was coming in, control, propaganda, and it's just the transformative power of technology was being muted by people that did not want trans social transformation to happen. And so I kind of, I fell out of love with the tools, you know? And that was a big deal for me because um, I was like, oh, that was, it was, it was my career, it was my identity, it was my social life, like it was everything. And I was like, oh, I don't want to do this anymore. Mm -hmm. And so that was tough. Um, but yeah, I, I kind of did my period of discernment and I was like, well, what do I still care about? Like, well, I still care about social justice. I still care about activism. I'm still interested in, in innovation and what is the next way to do things. Um, and yeah, that's why I decided, it's like, well, technology is not the thing, but the methods we use to create technology, which is, you know, user-centered design, human-centered design, participatory design, you yes. know, build, measure, learn cycle. It's like that, I think, is actually a nugget that I could take forward. Nice. So, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as this year, it, you were mentioning how you're pivoting. Uh, tell me about redesign. Mm, so what, yeah. what needs to be redesigned? I, I oh, guess okay. the simple answer is everything or... <laughs> Simple answer is everything. And I, I am I am talking about the US. Mm -hmm. I do, I did work a, abroad through a lot of my 20s, which was fun. But I think, I, I feel a responsibility for the US as a country. I feel like I want to work on fixing the US. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, all of our all of our institutions here in the U.S., yeah, are these products of, you know, white, uh, I would say capital, capitalism facilitated by white supremacy, yeah. uh, which is obviously destroying human beings, destroying the planet. Like, it's just, you know, it was like we tried capitalism <laughs> uh, and destroyed a lot of other systems in order to make capitalism continue. And it's like not actually going to help us even survive as a species. So maybe we should do something else. Um, and I would say I'm still, in terms of my professional life, I'm still in a period of discernment of if there's so much redesign work to do, you know, what does do big good focus on, right? And so that is something that will kind of percolate and we'll see what work we end up doing. But I think it would probably be in the social sector, right? Maybe philanthropy, government, nonprofit, which is still a lot. Um, but I do want to say that redesign is uh, a con the concept of redesign as participatory design applied to social transformation is an idea that that was generated by um, women of color. Nice. Right? So yes, yes, yes. So something that I discovered and I was like, oh my God, this is awesome. So yeah, the first, the first place I found it mentioned was this Medium post in 2016 by um, Michelle Molitor, who's the executive director of Equity Lab. Caroline Hill, who's the founder of 228 Accelerator, which is um, about uh, education transformation, and then Christine Ortiz, who's the founder of uh, Equity Meets Design, and uh, is, uh, is, I think, do tank merging consciousness uh, of equity work. Um, and then also I, I'm learning a lot from Antionette uh, Carroll, who um, has developed publicly a lot of the op operationalizing redesign work um, through equity-centered community design, so. In these ventures and in your research, yeah. um, just like, if you were to like not think about the obstacles, but imagine what the end goal looks like, mm -hmm. do you have an idea of like what kind of um, world we're working towards? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think I would say generally we're working toward a world in which life can be sustained <laughs> like that's the low bar <laughs> wow <laughs> like if we can like roll ourselves over that bar i'll be like win i i think more more aspirationally i would like to live in a world where all life can thrive mm -hmm. so that means the natural world and humans can all actually have well-being um so that's what that looks what what it looks like generally um, and then we could talk about basically these design processes are how we get there, how we come up with the specifics. 
Um, in a similar vein, as far as like your research goes, you were involved with, uh, or at least present for a lot of the Black Lives Matter protests this year. I mean, saying that I was there for a lot of them is, is there Too was much. so much. There was yeah. so much. I, mean, I think they're still going. Daily. There are daily yeah. protests. So I think quantitatively, I cannot say that I was there for most. I did spend a lot of time volunteering in the Chaz Chop. Yeah, um, tell me about that. That was going on. And yeah, I mean, I understand why they shut it down. Because <laughs> it was really revolutionary. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, I think when I think of Chaz Chop, the thing that first comes to mind is there was, I think maybe the second weekend, they had these uh, events, these public events, um, just right at the intersection where the precinct is. Um, and there was an event that was, um, where they had a series of black women that were speakers. And then they had an event um, led by indigenous people. And it was the first time in my life that I'd actually been in a space that physically and like uh, epistemologically centered black people, and indigenous people. Wow. Like I realized that I had never actually seen that. Like I had seen people saying, oh, we're centering indigenous people and black people. And, I, and after seeing this in Chow Chow, I was like, oh, I've actually never seen this before. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and, and, and just, just without filter being like, this is what we want to talk about. This is what we're seeing. This is what matters. And I was like, oh, this is dangerous. Like, this is dangerous to the status quo. I could, I, they're going to shut this down. Yeah. Which you is know? what, because, which yeah. means it's, uh, it was effective. <laughs> right. If it, if it has that feeling of like endangering the status quo, it's, it's doing mm. exactly what it's set out to do. Yeah, I mean, and also just creating, like, they're creating a different kind of culture, mm -hmm. right? A create a culture that was actually like, oh, let's actually talk, let's actually be honest about what's going on, and let's actually think about and create and model the alternative culture we're talking about and show that it's actually great. Like, that is the danger. The danger, the reason it was dangerous was because it was clearly great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you and know, I if think they had been the, like... <laughs> that's the thing that I want to examine is that, like, yeah. For, for example, like, I don't, I don't know if you experienced this, but f like Fox did a piece on the autonomous zone on the mm. Chaz Chop area. And yeah. my peer group all got phone calls from like our parents saying, what is going on in Seattle? Like, it sounds like a war zone. And th in their minds, they heard dangerous. And I don't think they're hearing dangerous in the same way that you're, like, you were experiencing or describing danger. So, so, I mean, at the end, there was literally people being shot. Right. Right? Yes. My, my interpretation of that is that that was done intentionally to make the Chaz Chop dangerous. That it was part of a strategy. And uh, basically, which, which part was part of the strategy? People being shot in the Chaz Chop. Oh. I think that is my, my analysis mm -hmm. is that it was not just like, oh, they're just having speech crime in the Chaz Chop. Like, I think, I it think was they an were excuse. Uh, people seeking to undermine it by creating violence in the Chaz Chop. Mm -hmm. My interpretation. This is also what happened in Tahrir Square during the Arab Spring is the Tahrir Square was also an occupation. It also created all space for alternative culture and talking about alternative futures. And there was, in that case, it was a government led effort to bring crime and sexual assault. And I don't know if people were killed, but maybe into Tahrir specifically to make it dangerous, specifically to get the activists out to specifically to shut down this reimagining of what Egyptian society could look like. So it is unfortunately, you know, it, it was damn like Chaz Chop was dangerous to, I see what you're saying. Like it was dangerous to the status quo in that it was creating an alternative space that, because, because basically. It was revolutionary. Correct. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. It was not, it was not, yeah, it was not for most of it dangerous in terms of like property or. Right. Shakedowns or whatever they were saying was happening. I think what, uh, 
is like possibly exciting about that rhetoric is that it makes it feel like redesigning the system is possible. If it's dangerous to the status quo, that means like, there is enough movement that we can realize this <laughs> sustainable future that we're imagining. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the argument of the right is that this horrible system that is causing people to die, to lose their jobs, that's destroying the planet, that it's the best system. Yeah. Right? That's their argument, is that it's not, because what's actually happening is that system is not a good system, but it's being enforced through violence. That looks like a lot of things. Mm -hmm. You know, it looks like people not having living wages, it looks like people being killed, people being stopped, you know, it's, there's all that, but that is actually how the system is portrayed is through violence of various kinds. But their rhetoric is, no, it's actually just the best system. So if you have an alternative system, even that exists within like a couple of square blocks that demonstrates, oh no, everyone can be, be heard, that if there's harm being done, we can be attentive to it without losing anything for ourselves, but just helping other people, that there's actually enough for everyone. Like showing that alternative and the, the alternative to current system is actually so much better and, and just more pleasant, like that, that is the threat. Man, that's, it makes me wonder like yeah. what kind of revolutionary uh, actions like, like the Occupy Protest Autonomous Zone mm -hmm. can happen from here on forward. Like how can we continue to be revolutionary mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. in the same way that is like has real power in challenging the existing system. Mm -hmm. Well, I do think the the work that, that King County Equity Now and Decriminalize Seattle are doing to realize budgetary changes and policy changes and operational changes in public safety in Seattle is the outgrowth of that occupation, right? It's the occupation was a protest. The occupation showed an alternative society. Um, and from that comes an alteration of current structures, which is redesign, right? Like redesign, we think of design, it's, um, we have a, we're starting with a problem and we're creating a solution, right? In redesign, the previous solution is the problem we are trying to fix right <laughs> right yeah. so it's not like it's not like public like absence of public safety is the problem that we're saying oh let's create something it's like the solution past solution which is policing that is the problem we're trying to fix or like public education which was a solution to a problem of children being uneducated okay now that's the problem we're trying to fix right um or you know, healthcare, right? Right. <laughs> so you're starting with an extremely complex, extremely entrenched set of institutions, and that is the starting point for a new design process. Seems like a lot of work. It is a lot of work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so I guess also, and this is also part of the vision that Auntie Nick Carroll has, um, is that this can't be a centralized process that there has to be just people doing redesign wherever they are, right? Like redesigning in a school, in a specific foundation, in a specific nonprofit, in like a specific coffee shop, you know, everywhere redesign needs to happen, right? And um, yeah, and Tianette has this, uh, she trains a lot of um, uh, black youth and Latinx youth to actually be redesigners. So she is really engaged in creating this decentralized mechanism of equity designers. Um, but yeah, so I'm thinking, you know, how does do big good fit into that? Where is our place? You know, yeah. what is our work? What is not our work? Have you found any answers? <laughs> or are you just still in the process of, uh, of finding that out? Still in the process of finding that out. Yeah. So that's one of the reasons I was, I was um, a little nervous about talking to you and you were asking me to have this conversation for I think like two or three weeks, is that in terms of do big good, we're still in emergent space. 
you know, to use the term of Adrian Marie Brown, uh, we're still in a period of discernment. So um, what I've told you is what I already know, but I haven't totally figured it out. Yeah, I think, like, personally, I think that's really, that's really exciting and also frustrating because I feel like I'm in the same space as you uh, yeah. in terms of realizing that I need to function in a new system that doesn't exist. So I literally have to invent every step of the way. Mm -hmm. um, but what you're saying about like activism and um, redesign needs to happen everywhere. This is exciting to like the nerd in me because okay. I believe that like the internet is an incredible tool to make that happen. I know it's like kind of a really basic thing to say, but I am on like Twitter and TikTok and I'm seeing collaboration happening all the time. Mm -hmm. And so for me, like the reason that we're doing this podcast is to make these conversations visible and to make mm -hmm. these ideas visible so that mm -hmm. anyone knows that like they can redesign within their sphere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which is, yeah. I mean, I think the the good news is that so it's not the bad news, but it's the challenge that we have is that we we do really need to redesign most of the systems in which we live throughout the entire world. That's kind of the the assignment. Um, the plus side is this is actually the first time period where that is even possible. Great. Because, yeah, because we really can communicate and coordinate, like the people can communicate and coordinate, you know, internationally, nationally, what have you, to actually collaborate to do this work. Like if we think of, you know, how did capitalism, how did colonialism propagate throughout the world, it was extremely capital, capitally intensive, capitally intensive is not nice. It required a lot of resources, right? If you think of like, okay, we're gonna put some guns on a ship and go across the ocean and kill some people and take their land. Um, that was really expensive. So the economics of world change, in that case, it was world change that was spreading systems of oppression. Mm -hmm. That was very expensive, that was very tough. <laughs> I mean, it's history, so it seems inevitable. It was actually very difficult, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas the change that we have to do now, we have, because we have this digital infrastructure is, more possible to do, fortunately. Still very tough, but yes. more possible. Yes. This is exciting and also I think immediately relevant to the future of work. Because if we're thinking about like our relationship to work previously was mm -hmm. you need to work for money to eat. And for me at least now, I'm like, oh, like there is Work, like actual work to do not and it like money is not mm. like the main motivator it is mm. we're like we're faced with like the problem and mm. it's beyond it's beyond the system of capitalism which makes mm. working on it just like strange <laughs> because it is it is you have to Similar. redefine the terms of work Yes, yes. So, right, because there is work to be done that is labor in exchange for money, and there is work to be done which may or may not be in exchange for money. And I guess to do big good is seeking to combine the two. <laughs> that is also, like, the goal, uh, like, my goal is because I would like, you know, creators and people who are trying to enact this change to get paid, but you get paid to eat through capitalism. Uh, but the mission of both of us is to dismantle that. Yes, yes, yes. And this is, this is what, so I actually, I, I published a critique of impact measurement. I think it was even last week. And I'd actually done the research like six months ago. And what I found in the research was, basically that impact measurement evaluation had been, you know, colluded with basically every awful system of like capitalism and white supremacy since like the turn of the 20th century. And I was like, fuck, this is the, this is my business, fuck. And I was just kind of sitting with that information, not knowing what to do with it. 
and then you know this black lives matter uprising came and i was like one i can't just fucking sit on this anymore it's too important uh and two i feel like there's maybe a space for me to say um just to, to say the truth you know and that there might be people on working in these institutions working in you know impact investing working in philanthropy that are kind of also realizing like um what i'm doing only exists because of capitalism and income inequality right i think that we are not alone in realizing this i think yes exactly that right right, right. Uh, personally just because of all the distance that we have um from work now that we like tens of millions of us are unemployed we have this time to reflect and we see like holy moly i've been in a system i was looking at a tweet that i retweeted that i really it's a sentiment that i think is everywhere is like why were we working <laughs> mm. like mm. why would what incentive do i have to go back to work now mm. and it's not just mm. like it's not just like as a money economy thing but like why mm. am i going to perpetuate this mm -hmm, cycle mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I, yeah know, continue yeah i guess i guess i would draw a distinction between commerce and capitalism not not everyone would right mm -hmm. some people would say exchanging labor for for money is always corrupt right i do think there is a place to exchange labor for money in which income inequality is, I would say, uh, mitigated, and that it's, it it'll still allows everyone to thrive, right? Mm -hmm. um, capitalism is, you know, commerce with this massive wealth extractions by the owners of the means of production, yes. you know, our, to quote our, <laughs> the well-known, uh, yeah. Carl. Our, um, our bearded friend. Our bearded friend that that is he's still controversial. He is still controversial, which is so fascinating. I think you know that he is possibly comes still a bogeyman. Understanding, yeah, he's still a bogeyman, which just just proves that his ideas are truly dangerous and revolutionary and all that. <laughs> um, yeah, so I do think there is, and that's why I own a business. I do think there is a place to work for money that is not uh, contributing to human suffering. Yeah, I, th I think it's tricky, but it requires yeah. a lot of this like hard work and also just examination of uh, contradictions. Yes, and tensions. And I guess I guess it's like, let's lean into the tensions instead of let's ignore the tensions. What, right. uh, like, currently is exciting to you? Like, do you see anyone who's doing uh, exciting work in this field? Or uh, have you seen something that you're like, ooh, this, this may be it? So I am very excited about what um, Decriminalize Seattle and King County Equity Now are doing in terms of, I can't say reimagining because that's mm -hmm. Jenny Durkin's work, but <laughs> actually recreating and redesigning public safety and health in Seattle and the participatory budgeting and participatory research process that they are developing to do that. I think that is really awesome. Uh, and I, I watched one of their, um, they had a press conference on Facebook Live, I think it was last week, um, where they were talking about, you know, how do you flip these power dynamics of money uh, for social services? Um, and part of what they want their participatory budgeting process to do, or I, maybe even the purpose of it, is that instead of nonprofits applying to the city of Seattle for these new, um, for this $100 million for BIPOC communities, that members of those communities are actually saying effectively, like, we want to hire this and this and this nonprofit to serve our community. You know, like, this is actually what we need. These are people we trust to provide it. And then, you know, city of Seattle signs the check. Um, and that's what, that's what I think I think that could be a transitional phase for philanthropy as well. Mm -hmm. Like I think in the, like I am looking toward a post philanthropy world in which people just have the resources to solve their own problems. Wow. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> ah, and don't have to ask rich people to help them. Yeah. Um, 
Wouldn't that be nice? But I do think a transitional phase for philanthropy is to um, give the beneficiaries of nonprofits the power to choose the nonprofits that receive grants and then sign the check. So this, yeah, this is more, more your realm than mine because I'm like, I know, we're talking about your... the power of work, power of work. Yeah, changing work. My, uh, but yes. I think maybe the way that we can ground this is like, yeah. Regular folks mm. want to help out and I, they don't have yeah. a lot of resources. Mm. Okay. So, how can people with not a lot of resources? engage in the kind of activism that you're talking about and the redesign because if it's happening at every level what can normal yeah. folks do mm. can you give me a scenario because there's just so many different like work environments like we can just say different work environments yeah i would say uh, like the people that i talk to are okay. folks that run you know small creative businesses online and that's where their mm. in income comes from mm -hmm. and they feel bad about it because they're like, I don't, I feel bad marketing during this time. I feel bad mm. like making content and selling things because oh. like, I recognize that this is the worst time to try to do that. But I also want to make a difference. Hmm. How can I like use my platform, I guess, mm. or like my energy as a creator mm -hmm. to enact change? Yeah. Um, so I guess, yeah, the role of, you know, kind of our artists, effectively, it sounds yeah. like artists that are working in a digital realm and are doing commerce in the digital realm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I would say that, you know, look, look at the, like, where's the money and where is the power in their own little ecosystems, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, supply chain, right? If they're buying or they're taking products that are created somewhere else and then like putting art on top of them or, you know, recombining them to create their own products, like are those people being properly paid? Is that manufacturing being done sustainably is one thing that's very practical. Um, another one <coughs> is, you know, certainly the content of what they're creating, you know, you can make art that, that embodies these ideas, like um, Amplifier is the famous one that's in Seattle and they create these beautiful posters mm -hmm. that combine activism and art. So that's, also, that's always a possibility. It, it doesn't have to be the full range of what they're doing, but you know one thing. Um, and there is the possibility of, you know, like donating a part of it or even just putting it out there and just, that you know every artifact that we create that helps people see the world in a different way or have a critique is also part of this transition right mm -hmm. um and then thinking like what is the positionality and power that different creators have because of their you know race and class and gender and all these things and think is there you know who else's work that doesn't have those privileges that makes access and financial success more easier, you know, how can I, you know, shift focus, right? How can I like feature another seller or feature another artist or collaborate with another artist? Um, so, you know, how can we use our privilege to, to change, to change that hierarchy so that such that, you know. Yeah, that makes a lot of yeah. sense to me. Like for me, that's what I'm trying to do is just like show people where their position in a system and the system around yeah. them. And I'm like, hey, like this thing exists around you and you have the power to like manipulate it um, mm -hmm. in terms of like what you're saying, supply chains mm. and just realizing what your business is doing um, within your reach. And if you can yeah, exactly. tweak that, you can make change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and doing it in public is also a big part of it. So not changing distributor and saying nothing about it or changing mm -hmm. letting sourcing know. but being like hey just you know i'm changing da, 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 because of this reason and i think that people care about the environment they care about human rights so that's actually has a, has a totally legitimate marketing function it's like if you were doing good work and you were telling people about it that is totally legit marketing like 
that is, you know, the, the reason I think that people get cynical is that people will make a statement and do nothing. But it's like, if you Everlane. did something, <laughs> yeah, if you did it, I don't know the Everlane case, but okay. like if you, do, if you do something and then you're like, hey, we did this to, to make things better, yeah. Yeah. That also that's also sets a standard and then other people are like fuck oh my god we have to do that too because i didn't know but now it's like the norm and that's also how this happens is yeah you know people shifting and then other people trying to catch up because we're so we're so social yes right that so, gives me hope because it se- that seems like, super achievable mm-hmm. uh in the mm-hmm. short term mm-hmm. uh we are we're nearing the end i was looking okay. through your uh bio on okay. do big good Mm-hmm. And one of the things that you listed, you, you're a fan of superhero films, is I am. what you said. And I'm curious yes. about it because personally, like I, the whole Marvel thing, I'm I'm over it. And I'm curious what mm-hmm. which ones you like. Okay, I guess I guess um, I do. I am one of those people that gets a little teary eyed at the end of Avengers Endgame. <laughs> <laughs> Where, you know, they're all, you know, the superheroes who are, like, all straight white men, which is, like, thumbs down. Yeah, yeah. But they're all out there on the field, and they're totally defeated. And then, like, everyone shows up, and it's like, let's do this. Like, we have enough people. Let's go. Yes. And it's like, hmm. Hmm. Yeah, for me, that's... That touches like me. Lord of the Rings, too. <laughs> Where, where they get all the reinforcements, just like, oh, yes. Yeah, the reinforcements, there's something very touching, like, it hits me in a really deep place, Re- reinforcements. Yeah, I think, yeah. I think that's the strength of the internet and being public about this, is that I think you and I and everyone else can see we have reinforcements, mm-hmm. <laughs> which yeah. is radical. Yeah, and I, yeah, so, yeah, that's that's why I'm I'm feeling much more positive than I was at the beginning of the pandemic, because the pandemic the end kind of was just like the dismantling, and the like destruction, and that's actually still happening. Uh-huh. But like the people, the people are strong and the people are fucking smart. Excellent. Well, yeah. we'll leave on that. <laughs> I think that this uh, this hits all the points. Thank you so much for uh, joining me, and I will see you in Seattle. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, Connor.